What are you selling, really? It sounds like a strange question because clearly we're selling videos or theatre or architecture or music or photography or many of the other things in the creative industries. But the question is, to put it a slightly different way, what is the customer buying, really? And increasingly, we see that customers want to buy experiences. And that's why in Sweden, they don't talk about the creative industries so much as the experience economy. That focuses very much on the customer experience rather than what we're selling to them. And experiences are largely to do with culture in the broadest sense and the uh, associated uh, status, uh, enjoyment and connections uh, associated with products. So we, we need to think about what people are getting really from our products and then we can align them even more closely to their needs. So let's look at music. People uh, want to listen to music and they can buy downloads. In fact, they can probably get a lot of free downloaded music. So why do they pay an enormous amount of money and go to great trouble to go to music festivals to listen to music? Are they really just going to listen to music that they could listen to on their MP3 player? No, they're going for the whole experience, the live experience of a performance, but also the community feel, mixing with other people, uh, the whole enjoyment, the, ha the atmosphere. So we've got to be really clear about what we're selling and why and in that way we can connect it more closely to better pricing and to giving people what they really want. And what people are buying really is often these intangible things that are hard to pin down but they are nevertheless very real. I'm thinking of a sense of community um, or connection with the creators or with other people in the audience. About status, the association of buying and using a product or a service. A feel-good factor perhaps. Um, maybe they're buying into the backstory of the, the artist or creator or the organisation. So there are many things that people are buying um, on top of the obvious product or service which is the starting point. And also people want to know and are buying into not just what you do, but why you do it. The underlying philosophy, your purpose, your meaning, what drives you. This is increasingly what people want to know. And so this links very much to a great talk, um, video by Simon Sinek called The Golden Circle and which is about selling the why and not the what. Another example um, from my own experience, it's a, a case study that I wrote about, which is a designer fashion company in Hong Kong. They do all kinds of designer fashion, but a few years ago, they produced a special T-shirt, which was um, a different kind of project, really, because it, all the proceeds would go to the victims of um, a tsunami in the Asian region. So because it was to raise money, they called the um, T-shirts the Hope Tees because the money raised would give hope to the victims of the tsunami. And they explained on a little ticket or label that that was the case and they sold a lot of t-shirts. I think at the time it was something like, I don't know, 10 or $20 uh, Hong Kong dollars. And they made money and they gave the donations, you know, they, they gave the profits as a donation as promised. But it was only almost by accident afterwards when talking to customers, uh, doing some informal market research, sort of casual market research, you might say, they discovered that many people had bought the t-shirts and never actually opened them or worn them because people weren't actually buying t-shirts to wear they were buying into the purpose of the project they were buying hope 
And so once you realize this, you think, well, there might be a limit on what we can charge for a t-shirt, but is there a limit on what we can charge for hope? And so looking back, they thought that they might have charged a lot more money for those t-shirts because they weren't selling t-shirts at all. They were selling hope. There's another case of uh, a museum in London, the Victoria and Albert Museum. It's very famous for design. And they obviously are very proud of the, the exhibitions, uh, all the design content. It's amazing. But they did some market research and, re and found out that the first thing people ask when they arrive at the Victoria and Albert Museum is, where are the toilets? <laughs> now, OK, fair enough. The second thing they ask is, where is the cafe? Because people have perhaps traveled a long way and they want a cup of coffee and one of those excellent cakes that they sell. And they came to realize that this was a major attraction of the museum. So they had um, an advertising campaign which became quite infamous because they described the Victoria and Albert Museum as, quote, an ace calf with quite a nice museum attached. It was very tongue in cheek, but I think it hit a nerve. And I think it, um, a lot of customers and visitors would recognize that uh, in their own behavior and what they got out of their day at the museum. And then another story, if you know, again, from my own experience is I was invited to Brazil before the Football World Cup was held there because they realized that they would get an enormous amount of visitors. And this was an opportunity for the creative industries to sell more products to these foreign visitors. And I was working with some arts and crafts and jewelers in a particular city. And what I found was that their jewelry was absolutely amazing. It was connected to indigenous culture. Um, the craft and work was was fantastic um, but they were missing a trick because although people would buy the jewelry they want to know more than they want to know more about it they want to know what is the backstory what is the heritage who made it why did they make this particular design is there a connection with you know history or legends and so I suggested to them that it was about the packaging or the, the story, shall we say, as much as about the jewellery itself. Because they were simply selling the jewellery um, and the, from a stall and then putting it into a paper bag or a plastic bag. And I think that diminishes the value of the product because what people want to buy is a feel-good factor, a, an association with the, with the creators, um, some information about the backstory because they might be buying gifts to take home to give to somebody. So again, once we understand what people are buying really, we can package it um, in the right kind of way and sell them everything they want to buy, the story, the experience, etc. And to finish with a couple of um, personal reflections about my own work. And Many years ago, I was the managing director of a book distribution and marketing company. We sold a lot of poetry books uh, and literature. And I heard a story about a bookshop in London that had had a special offer. They'd put a, a voucher for £10 into the uh, Booker Prize winning novel they were selling at that time. And they put the voucher into into the book, you know, at page 200. And that meant that people would find the voucher, they would come and exchange it for a, another book, and they would get more, more customers and more sales. But it was surprising how few people returned those vouchers. Um, it was about 11% in the end. And it was curious to know why, and I'm speculating here, but I reckon that a lot of people never found the voucher because they never got to two, you know, page 200 of that Booker Prize winning novel. They liked the idea of buying the novel. They liked telling their friends they bought the novel. They liked perhaps putting it on their coffee table at home, but actually reading it was harder work than they expected. So they never finished the book and never found the voucher. 
And that made me think, you know, what are people buying really when they buy a Booker Prize winning novel? Is it the, for the purpose of actually reading the novel? Or is it, shall we say, a cultural association, a badge of culture? And it made me think, and I'm, I'm joking here really, but you know, why would we um, sell books with content? If people were buying our poetry books just to put on the shelves to show that they had some culture amongst their bookshelves, then you know, we could make a great profit by selling you know, empty books just with the cover. Um, and you know, clearly I'm being tongue in cheek here, but it does make you think what people are buying really and whether they're buying cultural products or associating with creative um, enterprises and services for the sake of the status, um, what it makes them look like, etc. And finally, you know, I talk about my workshops and I often say to people that, you know, when I started doing my workshops and I read the evaluation sheets, what I hoped people would say is that the best thing about the workshop was the pearls of wisdom that came from the mouth of David Parrish. <laughs> but they never did say that. They said the best thing about the workshop was getting away from the office or studio for a whole day in peace and quiet to think about their business development. Or the best thing about the workshop was uh, meeting other people and chatting at lunchtime and learning tips and tricks from other creative entrepreneurs. So I came to realize that I wasn't selling my pearls of wisdom. I was selling a day out. Uh, a nice lunch, a, an opportunity to reflect and speak with other people. And I made sure from that moment on that, you know, we always did have a nice lunch, plenty of time for other people to talk with each other. And once I realized what people were buying really, I adjusted my service, the workshops, to, to meet that requirement. Clearly, I, I also add a lot of uh, value and pearls of wisdom too but it's not just about the obvious thing you're selling, it's about the whole experience, the whole package, and that's what customers are buying, really.